Uh, I'm a, a dermatologist. Uh, I do not have any training in rheumatology except what I learned in medical school, which, as you might guess, is, is not that much. In fact, uh, my, uh, my background is that of an MD-PhD physician scientist. They hired me in the derm department at Wake Forest not to be a psoriasis specialist, but because they wanted me to run a test tube research lab. Uh, they only gave me one half day a week of, of clinic to do. Does anybody know which one they gave me? Right afternoon. How'd you, yeah, exactly right. And then uh, after I was there for a year, one of my colleagues, uh, who was our psoriasis specialist, left. And the next day, I was the psoriasis specialist for several states in the southeast United States. And um, you know, I needed a very simple, straightforward way of thinking about psoriasis. And, and, and so I have sort of a, a generic structure that I use for thinking about it. I think um, this will be helpful, and we'll use this um, for understanding psoriasis. And I, I'll lead off this discussion with information about psoriasis, background information, uh, before we launch into what I hope will be an interactive discussion of what may be the most important thing about an interdisciplinary meeting like this, and that is how we can best interact. Now, in, in, in the standard model, I, you know, I, I'm a nerdy test tube scientist. I'm not, you know, a naturally empathetic person with, you know, good people skills. And so when I see people with psoriasis, the first thing I have to remind myself, Steve, don't forget, take care of the patient's psychosocial issues. And I imagine there are psychosocial issues when you're dealing with bowel disease, if you're dealing with joint disease, but when you're dealing with lesions on the skin surface, there are psychosocial issues. It affects how people look at themselves. It affects how other people look at you. It affects how you think other people are looking at you. And so, number one, I have to address the psychosocial issues. And because I have no skills in that regard, I, step one is to make sure I encourage every single patient I see to, to at least encourage them to join our National Psoriasis Foundation, which is a fabulous resource for, for them to learn all about you know, how to manage social situations, as well as to learn about um, the advantages and disadvantages of all the different treatments that are available. The next thing I have to do, uh, and, and fortunately the federal government reminds me to do this, I have to have a review of systems, you know, in my documentation, and a pertinent review of systems item for every psoriasis patient is to ask about joint symptoms. So I'm pretty good about um, asking people about joint symptoms at every visit. But the question is, in dermatology, since I'm not a rheumatologist, I need to know what questions to ask about the joints and what to do with the answers that I get. Uh, my primary answer is, if there's any form of joint symptom, to send the patient to the rheumatologist, along with you know, an, ad an advice to take some ibuprofen in, in until they get there. But I, I think we can, we can discuss this in, in much greater detail. Um, and then we get to how do you manage the skin lesions, and I think of patients as being in two general groups, patients who can put topicals on all their spots and patients who can't put topicals on all their spots. And if they can put topicals on their spots, I give them a topical steroid and I get them to use it, and they usually do just fine. I like to think that when I've made the diagnosis of psoriasis and I prescribe medication for it, uh, and the patient doesn't get better, it's usually for one of three reasons. Uh, the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment are not two of the three reasons. Uh, because generally speaking, I don't make the wrong diagnosis. My colleagues don't make the wrong diagnosis of psoriasis. You can usually recognize it pretty well. Generally speaking, we're not in the habit of prescribing the wrong therapy for people. Uh, when it comes to putting these greasy, messy medications on the skin, the number one problem we have is poor compliance. The second biggest problem is poor compliance, and the third biggest problem is poor compliance. And I won't go into that in any more detail in this lecture unless you ask questions, but tomorrow at lunch I'm going to, I get to cover that in much greater detail. Uh, for the patients who can't put topicals on all their spots, I think um, phototherapy is valuable, safe, uh, relatively nothing safe, you know. The cholesterol, your cholesterol level from eating this great lunch, you know, it's, it's not safe, right? So there's nothing safe, but phototherapy is 
relatively a safe thing to do to people, highly effective treatment. If that doesn't work, then you have a choice of giving people methotrexate or a biologic. I don't think you have to go through methotrexate to try a biologic. If it were me, on the basis of efficacy and safety, I would do a biologic before methotrexate. But not all of my patients are insured, but many of them are. And the insurance company says to me, Steve, we are not going to tell you what to prescribe. We just wanted to let you know that we're not going to pay for a biologic until, unless the patient failed methotrexate first. So given that, I prescribe methotrexate. Now, uh, you know, I like to think about, um, I have a very great interest in how different groups of people interact with one another, whether it's people in different religions, different countries, different specialties of medicine, the different specialties of medicine. If you understand the conflicts that occur between them, I think you, under you can understand a lot of what's going on in the world. And so while I have a great interest in what should I do here, you know, I'm also interested in sharing with you my thoughts about what somebody who's in rheumatology or gastroenterology should do in terms of, well, what should we be asking about the skin and what should we should be doing as far as management to the skin. And, and, and basically, in principle, I would tell you that if you are entirely comfortable with this and you know all the different topical therapies and you know when which ones are appropriate and which vehicles to use and you know how to prescribe phototherapy and, 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 and when, when to use it as opposed to a systemic treatment, if you're comfortable with all that, then you should, you, you're welcome to take care of the, the psoriasis along with the joints, okay? But I also believe that that most people who aren't dermatologists are as, as, I guess, ignorant about this stuff as I am ignorant about joints. I don't know, joints and bowels, I don't know the first thing. And so, you know, I think, I think uh, I'm a big believer in collaboration. Well, first of our learning uh, objectives was to be able to discuss the uh, manifestations of psoriasis. And so I'm just going to spend a few minutes on, on general aspects of psoriasis to bring you all up to speed if you're not a dermatologist already um, with, with what this stuff does in the skin. Psoriasis is an immune-mediated disease. It's chronic. You get these red scaly lesions. They're quite distinctive. Uh, psoriasis, as you may know, is a lot like pornography. Okay. Uh, what is it that the Supreme Court Justice said? You know, you know it when you see it. And so, you know, we don't have to do biopsies of, of psoriasis. When a patient walks in with psoriasis, we typically can tell what they have. And it can be associated with arthritis and bowel disease. Psoriasis can affect any part of the body, can affect people of any age, but there's some characteristic areas. You know, if you see some some red scaly spots on certain body areas and they're not typical areas of psoriasis and you're wondering, gee, is that psoriasis? You might look and you might look at their scalp or, you know, the elbows, check the umbilicus, the knees, genital involvement is not uncommon. Uh, there's involvement here. Y'all remember the technical term for this part of the body? The crack. Psoriasis, you'll hear, comes in many different varieties. I like to think of it as all psoriasis. I'm a lumper. If you do a biopsy of psoriasis, they basically all look alike, except in terms of degree. So typical scaly plaque psoriasis looks like this. Uh, pustular psoriasis, I don't know if you can appreciate, there's these little white pustules. And you can see them with the naked eye, so you call it pustular psoriasis. If you look at this microscopically, you'll see microscopic collections of neutrophils in the stratum corneum. So it's pustular too. It's just that the pustules, uh, you know, haven't collected into large enough aggregates to see. So clinically, we call this pustular psoriasis, and we call this plaque psoriasis. But is there really a difference? I don't think so. Guttate is a kind of psoriasis that occurs suddenly, maybe in a teenager, maybe their first time getting psoriasis, or maybe somebody with a propensity to psoriasis or psoriasis of their elbows, and they get a strep infection, and then they whoosh, flare up with little droplets of psoriasis, guttate referring to the word droplets. But again, if you look at the histology of it, it's the same thing. And if you, you know, the treatments for it, we're going to do the same kinds of things typically. Erythrodermic psoriasis, well, all psoriasis is red. Dilated blood vessels histologically make it red. If it's red all over, then it's erythrodermic psoriasis. Is that a different form of psoriasis? 
yes and no. There may be some treatments we wouldn't do for somebody with erythrodermic that, you know, phototherapy might aggra aggravate it, so we might tend to do things that will just calm it down. And because, you know, erythrodermic and severe pustular, you know, total body pustular psoriasis can be life-threatening, we might hospitalize the patient and give them things that would work fast. In the old days, maybe cyclosporin in the modern era, Remicade, perhaps, to get them under control as quickly as possible. But other than that, the same kind of treatments uh, get used. Uh, all, the, all the drug trials, pretty much all of them, study only plaque-type psoriasis. Does that matter to me? Not so much. You know, pretty much all form of psoriasis is plaque-type, and I, don't, I haven't seen an insurance company give me a hard time to say, well, we're not going to cover the treatment for the psoriasis because it's pustular instead of plaque. Basically, they're all just check the plaque box. And psoriasis is associated with itching. Dermatologists used to be taught that eczema is itched and psoriasis doesn't itch, but when you ask psoriasis, does your psoriasis itch, they all say yes, or nearly all of them say it itches. It also has burns, it's sore, and joint pains uh, are commonly associated with the disease. What's happening in the skin is kind of interesting. The scaly layer of the skin is growing very rapidly. Um, a, a, a basal cell, before it sheds, normally takes about a month. In psoriasis, it's happening very quickly in just days. And then there's inflammation. And I think, you know, if you look historically, people thought, well, maybe this psoriasis is like a cancer due to uncontrolled growth of the skin cells. And they weren't thinking of inflammation as the primary treatment. And because they were thinking that it was a, a disorder of of rapid cell turnover, they decided, well, we'll treat it with methotrexate, and the methotrexate worked. Did it work because it was slowing down the cell turnover? Probably not. It was probably working as an anti-inflammatory. But, you know, lots of times we see things that work for reasons other than we thought they were going to work. I don't know if you all remember Amaviv, which was a, a drug um, uh, blocked the LFA3 CD2 interaction, and they thought by blocking this interaction, the, uh, the drug would stop psoriasis. And in fact, the drug did work for psoriasis, but it did not work by, binding, by, by, by blocking that, that adhesion molecule interaction. It actually worked by killing T cells. Fascinating. Here's what psoriasis looks like microscopically. We'll start at the top. The, what would normally be a very thin layer of dead scale on the surface is much, much thicker than normal. This collection of blue dots would be a, a, a microscopic pustule, a collection of neutrophils. The viable portion of the epidermis is dramatically thicker than usual. There's dilated blood vessels that account for the redness, and there's inflammation that's driving the process. Psoriasis is very common. Uh, Dr. Rose yesterday presented a slide that showed the most common autoimmune diseases, and I think Graves was the number one most common autoimmune disease, and, psori and psoriasis, which is an immune disease, maybe doesn't, not classified as autoimmune, wasn't on, on his graph. If it had been on his graph, it would have been at least twice as high as the highest of the autoimmune diseases. I think it would have been twice as high as his Graves example. It affects something like 2% of the population. One of the more common reasons that people come to dermatologists, um, interestingly, it's not a common skin problem for the non-dermatologist to manage. So if you look at nationally representative data, I think you, um, from the federal government, you find somewhere on the order of maybe, well, it was a million, probably now it's 1.5 to 2 million office visits for psoriasis in any given year. And 80% of those visits, maybe 90%, are to dermatologists. Uh, psoriasis uh, is more common where it's cold. Uh, you know, uh, if, if, you're, if you're trying to enroll patients in a, in a psoriasis trial, you usually want to, um, I, you know, the, the first thing I would tell a company is talk to Kim Papp up in Canada, you know, because he's going to have lots of patients with psoriasis to enroll. The last place you want to go is to Miami, you know, in, in the United States, where because of the sun and probably there's probably not as much psoriasis. Uh, for years, they said psoriasis was less common in African Americans. I think this was based on a study that uh, was done out of the Stanford Psoriasis Center back in the 1960s. 
Oh, the guy's name is on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember it right off, right off hand. But he, he had dermatologists across the country send him a postcard every time they saw a patient with psoriasis, that would, that, you know, collecting the demographics of the patient so he could write up the demographics of psoriasis. And he found that there were almost no blacks with psoriasis. But this meant, really, that there were no blacks seeing dermatologists. With, for psoriasis, and it did not necessarily mean there were no blacks with psoriasis, and I think the selection bias colored the impression of, of, of this statistic. Um, what makes psoriasis worse? Well, infections are thought to make it worse. Propranolol, lithium makes it worse. Does stress make psoriasis worse? I don't know if stress makes psoriasis worse or not. I think when people are stressed out, it makes them feel like their psoriasis is worse. I said I was going to talk about compliance and adherence to treatment tomorrow. I think when people are stressed out, they're less compliant with their treatment, you know, and so does that make it worse? I don't know if there's a direct effect. I am not a big believer that the brain is connected to the spleen, is connected to the skin. I think there's other reasons why stress could make things worse. Genetics of psoriasis, uh, there's, you know, early onset and later onset. There's clearly genetic propensity. Identical twins have a high propensity of, of, of developing psoriasis. And we've heard extensively about genes associated with psoriasis and other uh, immune diseases. Uh, for treatment reasons, uh, when I see that interleukin-23 genes and TNF-related genes are associated with psoriasis, it gives me some greater comfort prescribing drugs that affect those pathways. Psoriasis um, can be very mild or it can be quite severe. And um, you can measure the severity of the disease in a number of ways. Uh, one way is to just look and see how red, thick, and scaly the spots are, and how much of the body is covered. Or you could just, even more simply, just look at how much of the body is covered, and you would get a pretty good estimate of severity. Um, it, that would give you a pretty good estimate of the objective severity. The other way to, to measure severity and one that may be more relevant clinically is to ask patients how much it's bothering them. If you've got somebody who's totally covered with psoriasis and it's not bothering them, you could argue it's not really very severe psoriasis. If you've got somebody with a couple spots who feels, especially a young, single person, you know, who feels like, I can't date, you know, or, you know, a couple spots on the shin of a young woman who feels like, you know, I can't, I can't wear a skirt, you know, I, you know they, they may feel even relatively objectively mild disease is really quite severe and impactful on their lives. A number of studies have been done in, in medical practices um, that looked at how bad the psoriasis was at any moment in time. We did one of them. Uh, John Koo in San Francisco did another. And um, I, I these kinds of studies, if, if they're done in that setting, are, are, are highly biased because um, the people who come in to be seen are going to have worse the disease on average than the people who don't come in to be seen. I assume that if you, you know, like, for example, if, you, if you're wondering how common psoriatic arthritis is in a population of patients with psoriasis, if you do the study in Daphna Gladman's uh, psoriatic arthritis clinic, you'll find that 100% of the people with psoriasis have psoriatic arthritis, or quite close to that. That said, uh, when we did our study, uh, we found that none of the patients we had seen were in remission, or, or almost none. This is how good we were at clearing psoriasis back in the 1990s. You know, we had a lot of patients with moderate disease, some with severe uh, some with mild, and almost nobody was well controlled in the pre-biologic era. A much better study of this was done by our National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, they um, contracted with one of those survey re consumer survey research firms, the kind that Procter & Gamble might hire, you know, to survey households across America about Tide detergent or Dawn dishwashing detergent. Uh, and they sampled representative households across America, so there was no bias about who goes to see it. Well, there was less bias of who goes to see a doctor. And they asked, has anybody in this household been diagnosed as having psoriasis? And 
And, and uh, so I think that's where about a 2.5% of the population has psoriasis incidence comes from, and I think that's the best data for it. Um, and they asked in the survey, if you have psoriasis, how many palms worth of psoriasis do you have, where a palm is basically 1% of your body's surface area. And they found that only a tiny fraction of the people had 10 or more palms worth of psoriasis. Uh, 3 to 10% had what you might call moderate to psoriasis. Uh, 1 to 2% 1 per, or 2% or, or less, the vast majority of people with psoriasis have 2% or less. The people who are seeing doctors are enriched for the more severe disease. You know, so if you were a company and you were developing a, you know, a product, a biologic for severe psoriasis, you might be thinking, well, let's see, 2.5% of the population has psoriasis, 3 million people, that's over like 7 million something people with psoriasis in America. And the studies in the doctor's offices show that a third of the patients have moderate to severe disease. That means there's 2.5 million candidates for biologic therapy in psoriasis. And that is a gross overestimate because you can't apply the 30% moderate to severe in the office to the 7 million people. It's really just a, I don't know, 10, what is it, 10% or less have you know, severe disease. Some of these people might have palm and soul disease, which would be disabling psoriasis. If they can't use their hands, if it's painful to walk, maybe 10% of the people have, with psoriasis have disease severe enough that they would require biological therapy. Psoriasis affects all areas of people's quality of life. Uh, in, in, in focus groups with patients, we identified 19 things about psoriasis that really bothered people. And uh, you can see that some of the objective aspects of the psoriasis and the arthritis were some of the things that bothered people the most about the psoriasis. The amount of time they spent caring for psoriasis, the nastiness of the treatment, odors, stains, the time lost from work, side effects of treatment, these were major bothersome factors. People, this, back in the 90s, people were spending like an hour a day trying to take care of their psoriasis on average. They were bothered by the inability to control the psoriasis. Many of them said one of the more bothersome aspects of the disease was the doctor's attitude about psoriasis. Uh, I, and, uh, and, and I'll come back to that in a second. People reacting negatively, people uh, being avoided by people, feeling self-conscious, all these psychosocial issues among the most bothersome aspects. I'm a neurotest tube scientist, okay? I can make the diagnosis of, of psoriasis from the door of the room, I can prescribe the therapy, hand the patient the prescription and walk out, and I used to think, I gave that patient great care. And then my patient satisfaction data would come back once our school started collecting the data, and, you know, in the, in, the derma, in the patient's comments, some of them said, yeah, Feldman's good. And others would say stuff like, I wouldn't send my dog to him, that uncaring jerk. Now, I knew I, I cared about him, you know, and I prescribed the right treatment and made the right diagnosis. But now, you know, I've come to realize I, I need to do a little more than that. So, uh, and this was reinforced to me by... Um, about the, in relation to the doctor's attitude about psoriasis when uh, the, our National Psoriasis Foundation had put together a program to educate college students about psoriasis. And they had a young man from um, college in California, and they brought him out to New York, brought me out there, worked with these PR people, radio, TV, for their national initiative. And the, the young man was describing his first experience with psoriasis. He didn't know what it was, you know, Probably he was 15, 16 at the time. He and his mom went to the dermatologist. You know, he's wondering, what, you know, I, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this means for me. The dermatologist walks in. She puts on gloves. She puts on a face mask before she touches him. And he's like, turns to his mom, and now he's thinking this was worse than AIDS. So now I, you know, I walk in, and I do the alcohol off the wall, and then I shake everybody's hand and I get down on my knee, and I take the patient's psoriasis, and I put my hand on it, and I go, oh, that's a really thick plaque you have there. I turn to family members, and I put my hand on my face, and I tell the family, no, this is nothing contagious. Something I learned to do from um, Dr. Calloway, an ancient dermatologist at Duke when I was a medical student. 
Uh, I communicate to the patient that they're touchable. If it's a young teenager with guttate psoriasis all over their back, you know, as I'm examining their back, you know, I'm putting my hands and touching all the spots. So that, that does two things. One, it communicates to them that I actually looked at their back because they can't feel me looking at them, but it also communicates that they are touchable. Of course, when you're a male dermatologist and you have young female patients, you have to be careful about how you are perceived. Um, psoriasis has an enormous impact on quality of life. Uh, I was working with a psychologist, Steve Rapp, at Wake Forest, and, and he's a, a, an expert in, in quality of life measurement and got interested in our psoriasis population. And we surveyed our patients, and we used the SF36 to, to measure quality of life, and we found that psoriasis on physical dimensions was worse than everything but congestive heart failure, and not shown here, um, uh, whatever, uh, emphysema. And then on the mental health dimension, psoriasis was worse than all these other conditions except for depression. And uh, if you looked at the full list, you would find that psoriasis was worse than cancer. And I, I said to my, I, I went to Steve Rapp one and I said, Steve, come on, worse than cancer? And he was like, well, you know, I've talked to these patients, and when, when people get cancer, the family and the friends come around, and the, they, they bring casseroles, and, you know, my wife had had a mild case of breast cancer, and sure enough, the casseroles came in and stuff, and, uh, but when people have psoriasis, it's the opposite happens. Everybody moves away, nobody wants to touch, the, do the doctor comes in with the hands behind the back and looks doesn't put the hands on, and so it has a huge impact. Now, a, a, a huge impact on the mental dimensions. Now, little known fact, this, this information, by the way, dermatologists loved that we published this because, you know, there was concerns that insurers might not want to cover psoriasis treatment. And showing that psoriasis was a bad disease was important to the field of dermatology. I will admit to this group that a, a lot of the impact on the physical dimensions was due to the patients who had psoriatic arthritis and not just skin disease alone. Psoriasis is associated with comorbidities. I think this is one of the, the hottest areas of, of research in psoriasis today. The work Joel Gelfand does and presented yesterday on cardiovascular disease, extremely hot topic. Uh, psoriasis being an independent risk factor for myocardial infarction, worse in patients with severe psoriasis. In fact, if you're between the, the age of, I think, 20 and 30, and you have severe psoriasis, you are at like three, maybe five-fold increased risk of having a heart attack. <sighs> That's bad, right? And, and, and we, we are, again, we want to make sure insurers cover psoriasis treatment, so we make a big deal of this. What is the risk of a 20 to 30-year-old who does not have psoriasis having a heart attack? It's pretty much minuscule, right? Okay? What is three times almost zero? It's still very small. Okay? So on the one hand, you know, when I'm presenting to payers, I would say this is a oh, cardiovascular implications. You've got to treat this. But I don't, you know, I, if, if patients come in and they're in their 20s and 30s and they're like, Doc, am I going to die of this? I'm like, well, you're probably not, you know. So I, you got to put things in the proper perspective for the proper audience. You know, the difference between relative risk and absolute risk is probably all a common understanding for you. All All right. The next uh, major section of this presentation is going to be on the safety and efficacy of av available treatments. And we're getting this in many other lectures, and so I will just run through um, some points about it. Uh, it. Here are things that I use for psoriasis. Um, so if patients are, uh, have just a few spots, I give them topicals. If they're covered, do I give them topicals? Yes. I don't just give them topicals, but I give them topicals to the worst spots. So I may give them a systemic therapy that will get them 90% better, and then I give them topicals for the last 10%. Do they use the topicals? That's another question entirely. Uh, phototherapy. Uh, you know, if you have extensive disease, I don't have to go straight to methotrexate or biologic. I can get a lot of people cleared up with ultraviolet light treatment. If they um, 
don't live too far away and their schedule's not too busy, they can come to my office and I give them light treatments three times a week, get them cleared up. If they live too far away and it's not convenient for them to come to my office, I could prescribe a home phototherapy unit and, uh, and that may clear their severe psoriasis. I can even send them to a tanning bed for management of their psoriasis. Many of the dermatologists in the room are probably shaking their head going, Feldman said some crazy stuff already, but now he's, he's gone too far. You know, tanning beds are evil, and they don't work for psoriasis. We could, we could talk about that, but tanning beds, there's two published studies. Chris, did you publish one of the studies? Yeah, she published one of the two studies on the use of tanning beds for psoriasis and showed that it worked great. I published the other of the two studies that's in the literature on the use of tanning beds for psoriasis. Our studies were a little different. My study, we actually got wolf tanning systems to give us a tanning bed, and we put psoriasis patients in it, and we watched them get better. And uh, Dr. Duffin's study back there, she, um, she did something more realistic. She just sent people to a tanning bed, you know, in the community. In half the patients, right? It wasn't all. Oh, it was all of them. So it was tanning bed plus acetretin. I'm going to go and look because I got it on my computer. And... All right. Uh, there are emerging treatments and systemic treatments that we're using regularly. Methotrexate, TNF inhibitors, ustekinumab, atretinate, um, which uh, Dr. Callis Duffin just mentioned that she gave to people along with ultraviolet light and with the tanning beds. Uh, PUVA is a, a treatment where we use ultraviolet A light along with sorrel, and we don't, I don't use as much of this as we used to because it causes skin cancer, especially if you later give somebody an immune inhibitor. If you were to give somebody with sorrel in and then send them to a tanning bed, you could kill them from burning off all their skin. I don't recommend you do that. But giving them a tretinate along with light would be a very reasonable thing to do to, for folks. Okay, so going back to this model again, if you see patients with psoriasis, we address the psychosocial issues. We encourage them to join our National Psoriasis Foundation. Um, if they have joint symptoms, we have to we, we screen for that, involve rheumatologists. If it's localized disease, topicals. If it's extensive, then along with the topicals, we give them something that treats the whole skin at once, like phototherapy, methotrexate, or biologics. I like to start with phototherapy. Uh, with the topicals, with acetretin. If that doesn't work, then biologics, methotrexate, not so much the PUV anymore. If those don't work, then maybe methotrexate with biologics. If a patient has had, has alcohol, uh, liver disease related issues uh, in some populations, you know, I see a lot of that. I might use hydrea in the place of methotrexate. Um, one of the nice things about, about being a dermatologist is that the rheumatologists have worked out all those scary you know, issues of giving people methotrexate plus biologicals at the same time you know, in RA, and so I feel really comfortable using those based on, on the safety experience that you guys have provided for me. Thank you very much. Okay, you don't use as nearly as much cyclosporin as I used to. Unless patients, you know, I, I actually put somebody on cyclosporin this week for the first time in a long while, somebody with horrific psoriasis, and I, you know, we, we decided because of his alcoholism to skip the methotrexate, go straight to uh, adalimumab, but to get approval for the adalimumab is going to take some time. He needs something now to control his disease, so I'll probably have him on cyclosporin for two to four weeks until the, the biologic arrives. All right, so which is the best treatment for people? Well, I'll talk about more of that, that later, but I don't think there's one best right answer. Um, because some patients want the most effective thing, another patient wants the safest thing, and so clearly I can't just say there's one drug that's best for you know, every situation. The most effective drugs probably, well, it's clearly not methotrexate or etanercept. Uh, on the other hand, uh, methotrexate's pretty convenient because it's a pill. Use the Kinumab once every three months. That's pretty convenient. Um, most effective for the joints, you may know better than I, but um, I didn't used to think it was used to Kinumab. But, you know, if somebody's got bad joint involvement, it might make me lean towards TNF inhibitors to some extent. For cost effectiveness, I don't think you can beat the home phototherapy. You know, a light box that'll last a lifetime might cost less than the 
first month of a biologic. And then uh, in terms of safety, I, you know, it, hard to know that too. Um, methotrexate uh, was, was uh, compared to head-to-head -to -head versus adalimumab in psoriasis, and adalimumab was more effective than methotrexate. So and I think that's, that's well established that it's a uh, more effective drug, and I think it's clearly safer. So I'm pretty comfortable using biologics first if the insurer doesn't tell me otherwise. Uh, in terms of uh, efficacy, you can find some different graphs, and you'll see different graphs in this presentation and others. Uh, where infliximab, man, at least at first you get really great, great results with that. Adalimumab and ustekinumab are not far behind. Tanercept's pretty good. Methotrexate, you'll see, depending on the study, different levels for where that falls, but I don't think it's where uh, tip in the typical dose is as good as biologics. Uh, when you start talking about IL-17 drugs, you know, maybe we're getting even a little higher than we were before. Uh, how about safety? Well, if you look at biologics in psoriasis, yeah, there's a higher adverse event rate, higher withdrawals due to side effects, and some risk of TB reactivation. But rates of serious adverse events, serious infections, lymphoma, congestive heart failure, not different between biologics and the control treatment. Uh, I will tell you the safety data with ustekinumab looks pretty good too. Uh, interestingly, in the first year you give people ustekinumab, you have a higher rate of non-melanoma skin cancer than you do in subsequent years as you follow the patients out. Why is that? Why would the drug cause skin cancers in the first year? Anybody know? Any of the non-dermatologists now? You know, skin cancers might be red and scaly and look a lot like psoriasis. And when you give somebody a biologic and you clear them up, you might see skin cancers that were there already in the first year and detect them. And then in subsequent years, you've, you've already cleared those out. And so I don't really know that the drug causes skin cancer. I think it, it helps you detect skin cancer. Malignancy risks are low. Um, how, how, you tell, how you figure whether a malignancy rate is different from the normal population, well, you can look at SEER data and compare. And knowing that you've got an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, I think, is impossible. So I think, you know, understanding the safety of these drugs is very, very difficult. MACE events, I think, is something that people were concerned about with IL-23 inhibition. Um, with Stellara, the, the studies favored that the placebo, that, that there were lower... Um, MACE rates with placebo than with Stellara, but it never achieved statistical significance. Now, that may be because it's, the study's too small, or maybe there's some real risk. Um, if you looked in the control period, there were no events um, in the placebo group, and there were events, uh, MACE events, cardiovascular events, heart attacks, stroke, um, uh, or cardiovascular death in the groups in the, in, in the groups that got ustekinumab. However, once one a single patient in the in the um, control group did develop a, a cardiovascular event, it suddenly became clear that there was no longer a signal. You know, so is there do these drugs this ustekinumab or this class of agents cause cardiovascular events? Personally, I don't think so. Um, however. It is conceivable that if you take somebody with severe psoriasis and their joints hurt and they're depressed and they're spending their day every day sitting in front of the television, eating potato chips with one hand, maybe beer and chocolates with the other, and uh, they're really not doing anything, and um, then you, they, they, they're watching television late at night, you know, and an uh, ad comes on the TV for the local uh, dermatology center that's doing clinical trials, and they see a clinical trial, and they go, I'll try it. And they go in, they get the Stellara, and now psh, their skin clears up, their joint pain's better, and they're like, I'm going to go mountain biking. I'm going to go have sex. And then they get an MI. Did the drug cause the MI? Well, sort of. You'd have a hard time separating it, you know, if you clear it. So much, there's, there's the potential for behavioral things to happen in the interim that would be hard to tease out. Uh, one of the things I think is important, you know, when, when we're choosing among these drugs is safety. 
Is safety, show of hands, is the safety the number one most important thing we need to consider? No, nobody. Don't. Yes, one hand. You know, I used to think safety was really important, and I'll talk later this afternoon about how I no longer think that safety is as critical as I used to think it was. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to communicate the safety risks to patients uh, in a form they can understand. And um, if you tell patients there's a risk of lymphoma, that does not put it into a, uh, uh, that does not put it into a good perspective because they go, I could get lymphoma or not get lymphoma. It sounds like a 50-50 risk. Um, I guess if I had a patient who came to see me with psoriasis on their elbows and nowhere else, and they said, Dr. Feldman, I saw the ad for a Tannercept on TV. I saw Phil Mickelson's doing so well. You know, what do you think? Should I go on a Tannercept? I might tell them, well, we could do that, but there is a risk of lymphoma. And that might scare them off. Now, if they have bad psoriasis and they need, you know, a biologic, I might tell them, well, yeah, there's a potential risk of lymphoma. It's, if you look, out of 1,000 people, maybe you know, 999 don't get lymphoma. Uh, you know, the risk of die, there is a risk of dying you know, on this medicine. The biggest part of that risk probably comes from the drive to my office for the follow-up visit and having an accident along the way. Uh, you know, how you present that, I wouldn't tell them there's one in 1,000 because because people come to Las Vegas to gamble because there's a one in a thousand chance they may win something. What you want to tell them is there's a 999 chance out of a thousand nothing bad will happen. People, when they hear one in a thousand, they blow that up to something that's meaningful. When they hear 99, 999 out of a thousand, that, that's much more reassuring. And you can do this graphically, you know, showing, oh, well, here's a thousand people, you know, one might get, you know, all these don't get it. Um, another way we like to show is uh, we tell them, okay, you know, whether we put you on drug or not, more likely than not, you're, 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 well, one thing I can guarantee my patients, and that's that they're going to die, okay? And they're probably going to die of heart disease, cancer, or stroke. You know, that's probably what's going to get them. If I don't screen for TB, there's a risk they could get TB. The risk of lymphoma is down here with shark bites, motor vehicle accidents, and lightning strikes. You know, I, that, that makes it a little clearer to them. And I'll just leave this up for all of those who are taking pictures with their phones. I think that's great. That, I am honored that you did that. Thank you very much. Okay. Some of the new treatments that we have for psoriasis, IL-17 drugs, they're very exciting in terms of efficacy. Uh, if, if they show you improvements in POSSE score, though, don't get too excited because what you really want to see is the percentage of people who achieve POSSE 75. That's much more meaningful than seeing the improvement in POSSE score. If the improvement in POSSE score gets up to, uh, you know, 75% on average, that means probably only 50% of people are reaching a POSSE 75. Um, Here's patients with a 90% reduction in POSSE score. You know, that's rip-roaring improvement in their disease. We'll probably talk more about that. Um, blocking IL-17 with secukinumab. I think that's the one closest to market. You know, here, here you have 75% of people reaching POSSE 75 at week 12. What's going to happen next? Uh, you know, I don't know. I hear my colleagues uh, in dermatology, the experts, going, I'm really excited about these new drugs. I'm really excited about IL-17 blockade. I'm really excited about a specific IL-23 inhibitor. I don't know what they're so excited about. Um, I mean, it's good. I want more drugs for my patients. I think I have like five patients with severe psoriasis that I cannot really keep under good control with the many options I have today. I am so much better at getting people cleared up than I used to. Having more will be great. But, you know, what I really need is not a, a more effective drug. I really want safer drugs. And a different mechanism of action is not going to guarantee me safety. What I need to see for safety is five-year safety data in a large number of people, preferably rheumatoid arthritis patients under the care of a rheumatologist, you know, so that I don't have to worry about the fatal brain infections that might be missed, you know, putting them in my patients first. Um, so, you know, the, day one, if an IL-17 drug is approved, I will be using it for my patients who failed TNF inhibitors and failed 
you know, interleukin-23 inhibition. But, you know, I'd like to see long-term safety data and know that there aren't big long-time risks. Hearing today that JAK3, genetic deficiencies in JAK3 cause severe combined immunodeficiency did not reassure me. Uh, but that is what it is. Uh, but in terms of efficacy, man, you know, IL-17 inhibition, better than the Tanercept, although that's, you know, the weakest maybe of our really good biologics that we have for psoriasis now. There's some new oral agents. Uh, tofacitinib, yeah, these are very good posse 75 efficacy rates, 64%. That's up there with, you know, maybe the best of our biologics, but again, you know, if you activate zoster, what does that mean for activating other, you know, you know brain viruses? I, I just, I'm just a dermatologist. You know, Gelfin says we're a very um, conservative lot, and I, I, that, I wouldn't argue with him about that, at least as far as I go. Um, a premolast, uh, man, you know, I had such high hopes for this drug because I really don't want to turn off people's immune systems. I really don't want to put people at risk of opportunistic infections. And, you know, Premolas is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. How many of you all took a phosphodiesterase inhibitor today? Show of hands. Anybody? Anybody had a cup of coffee today? You know, caffeine, that's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. You know, we're using those things. Those are phosphodiesterase inhibitors aside even from the Viagra and stuff. The phosphodiesterase inhibitors, you know, caffeine, that's like the most widely used drug in human. And the caffeine's a nonspecific phosphodiesterase inhibitor. I, I really felt like, man, this is going to be a very safe thing to do for my patients. And the POSSE 75 rates are not very high. So we saw with the Tanercept that, you know, maybe the double dose of a Tanercept, you're getting 50% people achieving POSSE 75. Here it's down at 30%. That's not so great, you know, the diarrhea rate. I don't think you have to, I don't think that's a, a killer. Uh, in fact, in the exhibit hall, they have a beautiful uh, uh, packaging for startup of therapy to, to ramp up the dose slowly. I think that's, that was, that's beautiful. Whether it's worth the expense for a drug that, that doesn't, well, I just wonder, you know, if the patient knows it's $30 a pill and th two out of three don't get a great response and you have to take two pills a day, how many are going to come back complaining to me? So... On the one hand, I really like to start off with safe things, but on the other hand, I don't like to have a lot of unhappy patients on an expensive drug that doesn't get, me, doesn't get them results. But this is the most important part of the talk. This is the part of the talk that I'm really excited about sharing with you, and that is how do we collaborate, you know? Um, and for discussion purposes, I want to present to you a study we did. You know, here I am in dermatology, and I'm taking... Uh, I am seeing patients with psoriasis, and they are at risk of developing psoriatic arthritis. They are at risk of developing a progressive deforming arthritis, and I'm on the front line, and I could be screening for it and, and helping patients get treated and helping patients get to the, to the right doctor to make sure that we don't have... Um, uh, that they, they don't go on to have a deforming arthritis before they get treated, okay? So I feel like I have an important role but I'm not a rheumatologist, so I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. And so um, we did a small study where we put together some, you know, typical scenarios that, that we as dermatologists might face, and then we sent these out to rheumatologists who are participating in the GRAPA organization, uh, people who we presume have a special interest in psoriatic arthritis, and we asked them, you know, what should we do in these various situations? Um, you know, what kind of questions should we be asking? What kind of physical exam do you want me as a dermatologist to do? When do you want me to refer? When do you want me to call you to try to expedite the referral? These, I think, are all important things that I would, I would love to know. What should I be doing? And, and there could be variation among rheumatologists in what they would want me to do. Some who aren't busy, you know, uh, a, a rheumatologist who recently entered a practice in Winston-Salem, where I live, said, oh, just send me the patient, you know, just send them right on over, because she wasn't busy. The, our university folks are booked up, and they're like, well, you know, we don't want to see them if they have fibromyalgia, but, but if they have, you know, inflammatory disease, yeah, we want, we send them our way. And I wonder to what extent 
it changes over time depending on whether, how much money they were making on Remicade infusions. I, I don't know, you know. So um, here are some, some of the things that we asked and, and some of the responses that we, we, we got. Um, rheumatologists thought that we should be screening for psoriatic arthritis at every visit. They said we should be asking about joint pain and stiffness, uh, fatigue. I didn't know that we were supposed to be asking about fatigue until they told me. The other thing that they, they pointed out to us is that patients, when you ask them about joint pain, may not think of back pain as joint pain, so that one of the things the dermatologist might ask is, in addition to asking about joint pain, swelling, also ask about back pain. They ask them about some of these other things that I think are beyond the scope of what dermatologists are reasonably going to ask patients. Um, in terms of um, physical exam, 90% said to examine the joints if symptoms are present. I'm not going to do that, all right? Uh, that, that is beyond the scope of what I do. You know, one of the rheumatologists said, Steve, you went to medical school. You can do a complete joint exam. I'm like, no, I can't. Uh, the 20% um, said only affected joints should be examined. 30% uh, said examine the hands and feet on all psoriasis patients. And 40% said do a complete joint exam, which is, uh, I'm sorry, joint gait? Uh, arms, legs, spine, spine, I don't know how do you, I don't know how you examine a spine. Is that a normal amount of ration motion? I have no idea, you know, I, I, I have no clue. Uh, is it swollen? Well, this one is, I guess. I, I, I did have a patient who came to see me once um, who had a hot red swollen joint. I had seen her two weeks before for psoriasis. She had a hot, swollen joint. The rheumatologist wouldn't see her, couldn't get in, because it was we're in our town at the time. We were full up. So she came back to see me. And I thought, well, I'll just call down to rheumatology. Surely, if she's got a hot, swollen joint, they'll want to see her. And, you know, because I'm thinking, well, it could be psoriatic arthritis, or it could be gonorrhea. I, what do I know, you know? And so I called down there, and they said, well, I'm too busy, can't see her. Here's what I want you to do. Give her a Medrol dose pack. Okay. Uh, we have any dermatologists here? Yeah, we have a few. What happens to psoriasis when you give the patient a Medrol dose pack? Do you all know? Do you all know what happens? If you ask any of the pointed-headed academics who teach dermatology residents, they will tell you that if you give a psoriasis patient a Medrol dose pack, you have a very high likelihood of inducing a pustular, a severe pustular flare of psoriasis. This is ridiculous, but they believe it. The reason they believe it is because they don't give, they were taught not to give prednisone, they don't give prednisone, but they see people who got prednisone in referral. Why did they see them in referral? Because they had a pustular flare. They don't see any of the, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands who didn't have a pustular flare. So they get this really warped idea about how risky steroids are in psoriasis. So if you look at, at the guidelines for the management of psoriasis published by the American Academy of Dermatology, probably doesn't even mention the use of prednisone. Our National Psoriasis Foundation has a wonderful book of algorithms on the treatment of psoriasis. It probably doesn't say anything about using steroids in people with psoriasis. But I am reassured because rheumatologists are giving people with psoriatic arthritis steroids left and right, and I just don't see pustular flares of disease. You know, I look at the, the clinical trials you know, in psoriatic arthritis, and, you know, what is it, 10, 20 percent of the patients in the trials are on prednisone. And so I, I just don't worry about giving the Medrol dose pack. I gave the Medrol dose pack, and everything was fine. That said, I'd rather you not put me in that position. I'd rather you just say, yeah, we'll see him. Send him on down. Um, when should we refer? Uh, some people said any joint pain, refer them. That's what I like to hear. Uh, if they, some say, well, go ahead and try a non-steroidal. You know, non you may think, you know, are just normal things to give people totally comfortable with it. Giving people non is not a big part of dermatology practice. I don't have a great comfort with non even. Uh, but I will tell patients, yeah, here's some Motrin. Take some Motrin or Aleve, uh, Naproxen, uh, Ibuprofen, and then, you know, go see the rheumatologist. Some said, wait till there's multiple joint in, joints involved. I was, I was sort of surprised by that. 
uh, when to expedite referral. The suggestion was acute joint pain or joint swelling would be a good reason to call them and try to get them in right away. X-rays and lab tests. Now, this I thought was fascinating. 60% said the dermatologist should not order labs or x-rays for psoriatic arthritis. I was shocked that it was this low. I would have thought, there's no way I should be ordering an x-ray. You know, you're supposed to order a PA and lateral. That's chest x-ray, right? No, not, not chest x-ray. You're talking about some other joint. OK. Uh, Forget, I'm not ordering labs and I'm not ordering x-rays. I, I would not, not only know, do I not know which x-rays to order, I would not know how to interpret them if I got the results. For treatment, uh, dermatologists, they suggested prescribed non-steroidals would be okay. Um, can use DMARDs and see what, how the joints respond. I don't think I should be doing that, okay? The reason I don't, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but let's say I got a patient with severe psoriasis. And, I, and they have joint symptoms, joint pain. And I clear them up with phototherapy and a little ibuprofen, or I clear them up with methotrexate or even with a TNF inhibitor, and their joint pain gets better. Does, is the fact that their joint pain better mean that there's no chance they're having progressive deforming arthritis? I'm not doing x-rays, I don't know. And so I would, even if I get rid of their joint pain, personally, I still feel like I should send them to the rheumatologist for an evaluation. If you think I shouldn't, let me know. But, but that's how I, my, my, um, my bias. Um, the other thing is, uh, with regard to this bias about treating psoriatic arthritis, I generally do not treat, do not change how I treat the skin depending on whether or not the patient has arthritis. Maybe other dermatologists will, but I don't. Uh, if somebody has extensive skin involvement and no joint pain, I think many dermatologists, like me, would say phototherapy. If they have extensive skin involvement plus joint pain, many dermatologists would say, well, I should use a TNF inhibitor so that I can take care of the skin and the joints. I don't think so, because what if... I could clear up the skin with phototherapy, and the rheumatologist says all you really need for the joints is a non-steroidal. Why, why are we putting patients on a biologic unnecessarily? It would be like if a rheumatologist saw a patient who had joint involvement that they thought they could control with a non-steroidal, but the patient also had scalp psoriasis. Do we want to have you guys give a biologic in that situation? Of course not, you know? It, uh, other recommendations. Uh, methotrexate if needed, use any DMARD as the skin disease, as the skin disease warrants, I think that makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, other things, other reasons for referral, refer to the rheumatologist for any of these issues. Uh, some said send them to ophthalmology for uveitis, uh, maybe I need to screen for that more effectively. Anti-TNF inhibitors for the joint symptoms. Use, use them for the skin disease and watch for joints. Dermatologists should not use in the absence of skin disease. You know, I, I think this makes perfect sense. You know, if, if, if you were treating a patient, if you as a rheumatologist or GI doctor were treating people and, and you saw psoriasis on their skin and thought they needed a biologic for their skin involvement, I'd like to see them before they went on the biologic so I know how bad it is. I assume that if I put them on a biologic for their joints before you get them, you would be left wondering, well, did they ever even need the biologic for their joints? And so it makes sense, I think, to refer first. So screening. A dermatologist should screen all patients for possible signs of psoriatic arthritis. Maybe it's reasonable for us to prescribe non-steroidals. We don't need to order labs or x-rays. I think we're general conclusions. Uh, avoid DMAR therapy for the joints if the skin doesn't need it. I think that's entirely reasonable. Consult rheumatology. If, you can't, if, if the joints are unrelieved, I, I'm, I have even a lower threshold for referring to rheumatology. And I, I've sort of covered this, that these principles, uh, I think, are universal, that, that just as what, if you want to know what to do when you see somebody with skin, just think of what you would want the other specialty to, to do if they saw a patient with you know, a, a GI or a joint problem. Okay, I'm going to quickly run through my last few slides to give Dr. Husney time to participate in this discussion. Um, patients are, are frustrated with their treatment. Under treatment is, is shockingly too common where 
patients have severe disease and even dermatologists are only offering the patients topical therapy. Um, patients uh, uh, are more satisfied with the, our newest treatments, which work phenomenally well. Um, there's interest now in, in, in maybe using something more, something uh, even higher bar than a 75% improvement in their POSSE score as a way of assessing the efficacy of drugs. I, I don't think that's necessary because we have a, a real good handle on, just as you probably have a feel for what an ACR20 is, I have a feel for what, you know, POSSE75 is. And so as new drugs are developed, primarily I'd like to know how they compare to the old drugs by knowing their POSSE75 rates. But patients, you know, if the, the clearer you can get them, the happier they are. And as long as you can do that safely, that's a good thing. One of the things that uh, will affect how, uh, how well patients do is whether they take their medication. And uh, I'll go over that tomorrow. Um, I think it's valuable to give patients the risks and benefits as you're educating them about the treatments in writing. For psoriasis, we have our National Psoriasis Foundation provides fabulous resources. If you have not yet visited our National Psoriasis Foundation booth in the exhibit area, I would encourage you to do so. Um, in addition to samples of some of the educational materials that they provide on individual drugs and the whole class of drugs, they will give you a prescription pad tear-off sheet so you could just hand one to the patient and, so that they can get the information they need and learn about the foundation. Um, in, in monitoring. I don't know about uh, what you do for monitoring patients. I mean, I think that's something we can discuss. My sense is rheumatologists do more monitoring than I do. I like a baseline TB test, a TNF inhibitor. I like a baseline uh, uh, hepatitis viral panel, and that's all I care about. The insurers might make me do an annual TB test. I think that's reasonable. And I don't do any blood work at all. I don't do any chest x-rays. I don't do any urinalysis. I have heard other dermatologists at the other extreme want to check CBC, complete metabolic profile, triglycerides, ANA, urinalysis, chest x-ray at intervals on people on therapy. And I just think that's overkill. Well, uh, I have covered a lot of, of psoriasis and how I, I, I choose treatments, uh, but I want to I want to give Dr. Husney a chance to to present the psoriatic arthritis perspective and hopefully have time for um, discussion and conversation. Thank you.